Great to see everybody here this morning. My name is Brett Blair. I'm the pastor here at Faith Baptist Church. It is a joy to have you join us this morning. I want to invite you to grab your Bibles and turn them to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be this morning. And uh, typically, just in case you're new with us, our approach for the most part is really just to take a book of the Bible, a scripture, just go through verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter. And uh, we've been doing something a little different at the beginning part of this year. We've been really taking our intentional time in January and then in February, um, really in a topic that I think is so vitally important for us. We've been refocusing ourselves on what our mission and vision is. And so beginning in February, we kicked off a 40 days of renewal. We've been using a prayer guide as a church uh, to walk us through that. And this prayer guide has been drawing our attention to some really key aspects of, of who we are as believers, who we are in Christ. And I hope that you've enjoyed walking that through with us. And it's never too late to jump on board and join us. And so uh, we'll share more about that at the end of the service today, about how you can use the Connect card to get connected with those resources. But today, specifically, what we're looking at is uh, the target of, of, of renewal, meaning in the foundations, right? And our book has been walking us through gospel, scripture, prayer. And I want to focus on prayer today uh, because, first of all, just for me personally, this is an area in which the Lord has revealed a great deal of improvement for myself personally. I've been deeply convicted by how the Lord has been stretching me and growing me in this particular area. I also have just been thinking about a lot of the things that I've been through in life and the, the different experiences I've had. It, it made me kind of go back to, I've shared with you many times, I've, I've been a part of and had the opportunity to lead several different mission trips before, something I hope and pray that every single person here at Faith Baptist Church gets to experience for themselves firsthand as well. And when I've led mission trips before, a major aspect of the training always focuses on how to respond to difficulties, disappointments, and dilemmas. Because... It doesn't matter how much training we would offer, the rubber would always hit the road when you were on the field. There's never been one single mission trip that I've been a part of, that I participated in, whether it was local, whether it was international, doesn't matter, where there did not, we did not encounter some sort of difficulty or a disappointment or a dilemma. And when this would occur, you'd certainly see true identities being revealed in the moment. Oftentimes, sometimes from the leader themselves or from people on the team, like when those situations would arise, you'd start to see the real identity of the people transform right before, or be revealed, I should say, right before your very own eyes. Several years ago, an article um, written by a man by the name of Watchman Nee, uh, the, I, the article was entitled, The Believer's Reaction. Listen to this quote from him. He says, by observing how a person reacts... We can judge who he is. A Christian should not have unchristian reactions, nor can a non Christian have true Christian reactions. If you want to know what sort of person someone is, just watch and notice the kind of reactions he has. I think that is very true, very telling of who we are. And so I want to direct you to do something right here, right now, in this moment that may not be very fun at first, but I can promise you that it will be worthwhile. So just for a moment, let's pause. And I want you to think about a recent difficulty or a disappointment or a dilemma that you or maybe your family experienced. All right. So just take a moment and let that come to mind. Maybe it was that plans didn't pan out the way you thought. Maybe it was a diagnosis that you didn't foresee. Maybe it was someone mistreating you or perhaps even your safety was at risk. I don't know. Those are just some examples, but you just take a moment and just let that come to mind. Now, as you pull that to the forefront of your mind, let me ask you this question. How did you respond? How did you respond to that difficulty or that disappointment or that dilemma? I want you to answer it out loud. I just want you to ponder that privately this morning, but how did you Respond, Or better yet, maybe the question should be, how do you typically respond when you experience various kinds of difficulties or disappointments or dilemmas? And I also want us to consider that exact same question in the context of the local church. Because really today, where I, I hope the Lord leads us is that we, as Faith Baptist Church, will consider how do we respond when difficulties, disappointments, and dilemmas come our way. Because in case you're wondering, the church, capital C Church, they've been facing difficulties, disappointments, and dilemmas for centuries, all throughout its history, from the very beginning. None of that has changed. Difficulties, disappointments, dilemmas abound. We have an example of this from Acts 4, which we're going to be reading from 
this morning. Before we read from the text, I just want to set this up. The background, the context is vitally important for us to understand. You see, in Acts chapter 4, the church has been born at the day of Pentecost. That happened in Acts chapter 2. And the Holy Spirit has descended upon believers in Jerusalem just as Jesus said he would. And miraculous signs and wonders are being performed. And the good news of the gospel, it's being shared and received like it never has before. And with every day that goes by, the scriptures tell us that the number of believers continues to increase exponentially by the hundreds, by the thousands. Acts 4.4 4 says about 5,000 men had now heard the message of the gospel and believed. That's the context of what we're about to read from this morning. But two men in particular who found themselves at the center of all this incredible work of God were Peter and John, who were two of Jesus' original disciples. The Holy Spirit was using them mightily to preach the message of the gospel and perform these miraculous signs and wonders. All of this happening right before their very eyes. And one example of this was when Peter and John, they were on their way going to the temple to pray. And sitting at the temple gate on that particular day was a man who had been lame from birth. He could not walk. And instead of just looking past the man, Peter and John healed him in the name of Jesus. That was their response and reaction to that situation. Of course, as you can imagine, this drew a lot of attention. Several folks who saw or were there just were completely amazed by what they experienced. And so being the opportunistic man that Peter was, he stands up, he preaches the gospel to this crowd of people who were gathered there. And yet in the midst of all of that, there was a dilemma. Here comes the dilemma. We see this and we read this from Acts 4, verses 1 through 3. If you want to look there with me, you can follow along. Scripture says, While they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple police and the Sadducees confronted them, confronted Peter and John, because they were annoyed, right? They were annoyed that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they seized them and they took them into custody until the next day, since it was already evening. Now, what you have described in verses 5 and following all the way through verse 22 is a series of conversations between Peter and John and the Jewish religious leaders. There's just this back and forth. And although we're not going to look at all the verses or read all the verses this morning, I'd encourage you to go check them out yourself. Read them on your own this week. But you'll notice the boldness of Peter and John is just astounding. I mean, they are not afraid of the gospel. Despite the difficulty they faced, Peter and John, they literally could not stop talking about the amazing things that they were witnessing God do in them and through them. They say that in verses 19 and 20. So that kind of sets up everything that's happened up to this point. I want us to begin this morning picking up in our reading. We're going to start in verse 21 and read through verse 31. Um, So if you're able, I want to invite you to stand with us as we honor the reading of God's word, beginning in Acts Chapter 4, verse 21. Scripture says this, that after threatening them further, they released them. So these are the religious leaders and the the temple police. They found no way to punish them because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For the sign of healing had been performed on a man over 40 years old. And after they were released, they went to their own people and reported everything the the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together to God and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of your father David, your servant, why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in fact, in this city, both both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, Assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God boldly. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I pray this morning that our desires would just transform right before our eyes. Lord, when we are faced with difficulty and disappointments and dilemmas, oftentimes, Lord, our 
true identity, our true heart is revealed in those times. And Lord, what we need, what we desire to be, is we desire to be a praying people. So Lord, help us to see from this example in Scripture today what it means to be a praying people, to respond as if we're a praying people. And Lord, from what we see and are revealed to us from your word today, Lord, help us to move into obedience and action. And I pray that that would take place right here, right now, beginning this morning. And I pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. So I want us to see, just really, I want to make three observations from this passage. What it looks like, what it means to respond as if we are a praying people. What is the response of a praying people? Because clearly we see the response and reaction of the early church here is a response of prayer. And so I want us to begin first and foremost by seeing this. Number one, the response of a praying people begins with praise. Begins with praise. We see that there in verses 24 to 28 of what we just read a moment ago. You know, here's what I find incredibly convicting. This is me personally. I'm speaking on behalf of myself here. When difficulty and disappointments and dilemma comes our way, what should be the first response? The first response should be praise. It should be worship. But oftentimes, that's my last resort. When difficulty, disappointments, dilemma comes my way, it is oftentimes my last resort. And yet, there's countless examples of of God's people praising him, even in the midst of hard, troubling circumstances, all throughout Scripture, several of which are just right here in the book of Acts. If you're looking for encouragement as far as that's concerned, like read the book of Acts. Time and time again, example after example, hard circumstances, like literally people being faced with their very own death because of what they believe in, and yet time and time again, they're responding with praise, with worship, with thanksgiving. I also think that it's incredibly revealing out of what we just read here in these first few verses, how they go back to Scripture. In my Bible, I'm reading from the CSB, and it's helpful here because it puts all of the Old Testament references in bold text. And so you see that there in verse 25, that they respond to the Lord. They say, you said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of your father David, your servant. And then they quote Old Testament Scripture. And listen to what they say. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot futile things? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers assemble together against the Lord and against his Messiah. You know what they're doing here? They're saying, Lord, you said this would happen. Why should we be surprised that we're facing difficulty and disappointment and dilemma? Because your word said this was going to happen. As your word went forth, as your gospel went forth, as your truth spread just like you said it would, this is what you told us was going to happen. And we're still going to choose to praise you, to worship, even in the midst of these circumstances. Now listen, my tendency, speaking for myself again, my tendency when I face difficulty and dilemma and certainly disappointment is I I tend to stress, I tend to get incredibly anxious, I tend to worry, and then I tend to seek control to try to do everything I can to just fix whatever the problem is or whatever I identify as the problem. So I want to ask you again the question I asked a moment ago. When these circumstances come your way, difficulty, disappointment, dilemma, what is your tendency? What kind of questions do you ask in situations like that? Do you ask questions like, why is this happening to me? Why, 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 Lord, are you doing this to me? What, what did I do to deserve this? Could you please answer that for me, Lord? Well, what, this one is my favorite of myself. What about my plans, Lord? This doesn't fit into what I had mapped out, like my five-year roadmap, 10-year, what, five-day roadmap, whatever it may be. I just doesn't quite fit into that, Lord. It seems like perhaps you're changing some things around. How do you respond? Then I want to ask you this question. What would it look like if we responded like the church of Acts, like the early church? What would it look like if we remembered that God is sovereign over everything? Even as they described here, Lord, that your appointed servant, Jesus, that he would go to the cross and he would die for our sins. He would raise from the grave just as God had predestined it to be. You know, 
Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4, makes this incredible declaration. I just want to share this with you. Just to ponder and think about when you consider how you respond to life's difficulties, disappointments, and dilemmas. Isaiah 26, verse 3 says, You, Lord, will keep the mind that is dependent on you in perfect peace. Listen to that. Let me just say that again. You will keep the mind that is dependent on you. Just like we sung a moment ago. I depend on you, Lord, in perfect peace. For it is trusting in you. And then verse 4. Trust in the Lord forever, because in the Lord, the Lord himself is an everlasting rock. I hope that's how we respond. That's how we initially take our first step closer and drawing closer to the Lord in praise, knowing that even in those circumstances, He is sovereign, He is Lord, He is in control. But second of all, the response of a praying people is also this, that we ponder. Verse 29, we'll look at that in just a moment, but ponder what? What are we, what are we pondering here? Well, essentially you're pondering your identity in Christ. Because once we, first and foremost, approach that difficulty, the disappointment, dilemma with a spirit of praise and worship for who God is, because guess what? Your circumstances, I guarantee you, they will change in life, but the Lord never will. And once we begin in that position and we say, Lord, we are praising you for who you are and what you've done, the never-changing God, that even in these circumstances, in all the difficulty and all the disappointment and all the dilemma, you're still God and I'm not, certainly. The next best thing for us to do is to ponder our own position. Consider who we are. And I want you to look at how the early church did this there in verse 29. just want to read one part of it. As they're praying and they're proclaiming to the Lord, they've praised him for who he is. They've quoted scripture. They've said, look, Lord, you said this was going to happen. We're still going to choose to worship you. And then verse 29, it says, and now, Lord, consider their threats. All right, so there it is. There's the difficulty, the dilemma, the, the, the problem they're facing. And listen what they, and grant that your servants, just stop right there. Don't read any further. Grant that your servants. I want you to circle or find that word in your Bible. Make emphasis of that. Because how did they refer to themselves? They referred to themselves as servants. Not as masters, not as you know, organizers, not as the ones who knew how to make the most of their circumstance. They referred to themselves as servants. Which meant that he, in turn, the Lord, he was the master, the provider, the rock, as Isaiah said, fully deserving and of our willing and obedient submission to his will and his plan and his way. You see, here's the thing about difficulty, disappointments, and dilemmas. They have a way of revealing how we view our own place in this world. They have a way of bringing that right to the surface. Think about how you replied earlier when I asked you about how you respond to times of trouble or difficulty, disappointment, dilemma, any of those. Consider now what that reveals about how you view yourself. How either highly or lowly you view yourself, certainly in times and circumstances like that. You know, I just have to say, like, I'm thankful. I praise God for how he organized this and matched this up. Many of you have said, like, hey, did you all, like, specifically or strategically time out the, the identity course, the equipping course with this 40 days? And I'd, I'd love to say that that was exactly like the way it was all supposed to go. But really, the Lord led us in all this. I specifically had a completely different plan for how this new year was going to begin in our preaching and our teaching. And the Lord just totally erased those plans. So put me to, t- to the test on, on this right here. And I just remember being in a spot where I just had to say, all right, Lord, I, I, I'm going to surrender this to you. But I have to say, I'm so thankful for how we've been digging into this identity of ours in Christ through that course. That our identity in Christ is, it's a powerful, it's a fundamental truth for us making it through times of difficulty and disappointment and and dilemma. Because what we need to do is we need to remember that we're beloved and accepted and, and righteous and complete in Christ. All those things give us a real sense of security. Because what we want to do in those times is, Oftentimes, we want to run and try to find that identity in something else in this world, in a relationship or some sort of thing that this world has to offer. And every single time, it leaves us feeling empty and oftentimes more guilty. Recalling that we're members of his body, the church, that we're the light of the world, the salt of the earth, ambassadors, right? Servants, as they referred to themselves. All these things keep our focus on something greater than ourselves which is exactly where we need to be. In those times of difficulty 
and disappointment and dilemma, what we need most to remember, to remember that it's just far greater than just us. Because it's so easy to become so self-centered, so narrow in our vision and our focus, which leads to the last point here, that the response of a praying people is simply to pray. Here's the bottom line. When difficulty and disappointment and dilemma, when they come our way, it's not about us. Let me just say that again. When difficulty or disappointment or dilemma or all the above, when it comes your way, when you face it head on, I just want to remind you of this, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about his name and his fame and his glory and his purpose and his will and his way. In, in my opinion, the difficulty we face, no matter how big or small it may be, it has a very specific God-ordained purpose, and it's to keep us on mission, to bring us back to the thing that we should always be about. And I want you to see how that happened for the early church, beginning there in verse 29, read just a part of it a moment ago, and we're going to read it through verse 31. Because listen to how they respond. It says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand for healing and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Is that not the most mission-minded response you've ever heard? They pray for boldness and for God to go before them and exercise these incredible acts of healing and signs and wonders all performed through whose name? Their name? No, 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 no. Through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And there they are staring difficulty right smack in the face. And that's how they pray. That's how they respond. And here's the result in verse 31. It says, when they had prayed. So this, all of what we read was a prayer. But when they had prayed in that way, the place where they were assembled was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak the word of God boldly. Just like they had asked. Their prayer was answered instantly. They were filled with the Spirit. What an incredible, powerful prayer. Especially in the face of difficulty. They didn't request safety or security. I want you to notice that. Like where in this prayer do you see them saying like, Hey Lord, could you um, change our circumstances? Could you like somehow, some way, like remove all this stuff we're going through? Could you just like annihilate all these leaders for us and just make it a lot easier? That'd be pretty great. No, no, that wasn't their request. They didn't request the trouble to go away. They didn't request for com some sort of comfort or safety in that. They prayed for boldness as the Holy Spirit himself would bring the healing and the miraculous signs and wonders. It says the result was that they were filled with the Spirit, and they began to speak the Word of God boldly. They were back on the mission that they were originally given by God to do. How incredible is that? And so I want to draw us to something that we actually touched on last week that's just been stirring in my heart and my mind for quite some time. Is our greatest desire to be filled with the Spirit? Is that our greatest desire? Is that your greatest desire? Is that my greatest desire? That no matter what the, the difficulty or the disappointment or the dilemma may be that you're facing here now or maybe at some point in the future, I, I don't know. But in those times, in those circumstances, in those situations, is our greatest desire to be filled with the Spirit? Because I said it last week, as a church, I hope and pray that what we would say is that our desire is not just to fill seats, but to be filled with the Spirit. Knowing and believing with all of our hearts that as we seek the Lord, as we pray for boldness, as we watch Him respond to our prayers that begin, once again, with a posture, a position of, of, of praise and worship, and then certainly contemplating who we are and responding to Him from this humble position that He is God and we are not. And so therefore, Lord, we lay these requests before you. Guess what? It changes everything about how we approach the Lord. 
The requests that we so often think are so important and so necessary, many times just fade. And we get back to praying for things like boldness and to be filled with the Spirit and to see God work in us and through us in ways that bring glory to His name. And so with that in mind, I actually, that's all I really have to say today. (laughs) Because here's what I want to give you the opportunity to do. I want to give you the opportunity to put this into practice, into action right now. And I have just some questions that I want you to think on that are all tied to what we just observed from this passage. First of all, in the spirit of praise, approaching God, no matter what you're going through, again, recall the difficulty or disappointment or dilemma that you may have faced or that you're facing right now. And in the midst of that, I want you to praise And the question that we should be asking ourselves in the midst of that is, who is God? Who is God? That's that's an incredible question to be asking. God, who who are you? Because if, if you truly believe, just like they declared that he's the creator of heaven and earth and the sea and everything in it, then that should lead you to praise. Or not. It should lead you to praise. And just to say, Lord, thank you that these are all things that are true of you. But then as you ponder who you are in light of who he is, it should truly lead you to ask that question, who am I? You are created by God, created in his image, designed with a very specific purpose, to know him, love him, follow him, and make much of him. We should ponder that question in our hearts. But it should also lead us to that mission-minded prayer that this church modeled so well for us. And ask ourselves the question, why am I here? It's to make much of Jesus. At least that's how I hope and pray why you view or how you view yourself and your purpose and your plan in the grand scheme of what God has designed. And so today, again, I'm going to give you the opportunity to practice this. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what difficulty or disappointment or dilemma has been Introduced in your life, maybe yesterday, today, this week, this month, this year. I have no idea. But I do know this. If we want to see God do something through it, we've got to approach him like this. With praise, with pondering who we are, and certainly in a response and a heart of prayer. Laying our hearts before him. And so in a moment, Nathan's going to come forward and we're going to have a time of response. But here's how we're specifically going to utilize this. There's prayer cards literally all over the room. I mean, there's, we try to make it as closely accessible to you as possible. They're all over the altar here. They're here at these white tables on either side of the stage. They're in the back of the room. And here's what I encourage you to do. I want you to think on those questions. God, who are you? Who am I? And why am I here? And as the Lord leads you, as the Holy Spirit guides you in that time, I just want to encourage you to get up and move and come get one of these prayer cards and utilize them in this way. Write your request down. Begin with a spirit and a heart of praise, thanking him for who he is, letting him guide and direct your heart, but just bring that to him. Put that request on that card. Because here's what we want to do. We want to collect those. Back in the back of the room, Steve's sitting back right by the collecting the boxes where we're going to collect those. And as you leave today, I want you to drop those prayer requests off because we're going to pray for these. We do it every single Thursday in our staff meeting, but beyond that, we're going to distribute these to our prayer groups. We're going to do everything we can to make sure every single one of these is prayed over because I hope and pray that you have the same desire that I have, and that is to see God move like this in our church, that the place where we are is just shaken by the power of the Holy Spirit, and so it begins with us approaching him in the same way. So I'm going to pray for us. And you're going to respond how the Lord leads you this morning in the spirit of praising him and pondering him and praying these requests all for the glory and the purpose of who he is and what he wants to accomplish in, a, in, in and through us. Father, we pray this morning that as we approach you in this time, that you would move among us. Father, that you would guide and direct our hearts to respond in the same way that the church of Acts did. In a spirit of praise, pondering who we are, but certainly responding in prayer. Not out of worry or anxiety or fear, but in faith. 
And so, Lord, in this moment, I pray that you would just stir hearts that are in this room. Lord, that pride and whatever other feelings may hinder us from taking that step of obedience would just be put aside. And that we would focus wholeheartedly on just being obedient to you in this moment. And Lord, even now, this is an opportunity for us to pray for one another, to share our burdens and pray for them, supporting each other, loving each other, caring for one another. And Lord, I know that there's so many circumstances that are represented in this room, many of which I have no clue about, but Lord, you know everything about. And I know it's in your heart, you desire for your people just to bring those to you. So Lord, have your way among us, move us, stir us, and I pray this is the beginning of something amazing that you're going to do here. Thank you for the opportunity to, to approach you, to pray to you, to give you all the praise, all the glory, and to be reminded of who we are. And Lord, in the spirit of that, ask you to move according to your will and your purpose and your plan. And I pray these things in your precious name. Amen.